our same group right. masters. And that was our Group B done for the day, but we do have our uh, relegation match here. And just to give you some background explanation on that, uh, let's put a positive spin on it. The player who wins this match is safe in Grand Masters. The player who loses this match will be playing Zim tomorrow. The loser of that match will be relegated from the European Grandmasters this season. We will not see them uh, in, the, in the next season. So we do see Tice going up against Hunter A. Sottle. What a match we have on our hands right now. Yeah, this is where things start to get a little bit more serious and a little bit more somber, but I think it is important to frame it in the context that Raven did, that what we are watching today, at least, is one player earning their safety, and the other still has another chance to fight for survival. But of these three players that we have left remaining, in the relegation bracket, Hunter A, Zim, and Tice, I think all of them would be a very, you know, tragic loss from Grandmasters in their own way. Obviously, Hunter Ace, a very recent world champion, widely regarded to be, you know, top five dead or alive in Hearthstone, one of the best players of all time, would be a huge loss. Tice, on the other hand, absolute legend of the scene, like Hearthstone Hall of Famer, free entry, ticket already right. stamped, Tice is on the first ballot. Zim, on the other side of that, though, I feel like it's someone we just haven't really got to know yet, you know, because we're here, you know, with techno technological limitations kind of preventing us from doing player interviews, we haven't really had a chance to talk to him, got to hang out with him a little bit. Um, at the player summit, but he's, I don't really think he's a player that's really got to show the world what he has to offer. Um, so to just lose him at the first port of call and him really not to be given the opportunity to shine would be pretty tragic as well. So um, yeah, I echo the thoughts of the APAC casters, which is, you know, why why can't we just have sunshine and happiness and rainbows where, <laughs> where everyone yeah. gets promoted into GM, but no one gets relegated. And it's it's so hypocritical because I spend the entire off season lobbying on Twitter and lobbying to you know people at Hearthstone Esports for more relegation slots, right? Like I I rant about it constantly that we should have more rotation and more players having upward mobility into this tournament. But then when it gets to it, I just I, I just lose my ball <laughs> completely. I can't bear to actually see people get relegated. Right. Yeah, and I, I think the big thing for me as well for Zim is that. Uh, uh, no one wants to do all the work to make it into Grandmasters and then dip out after one season, right? Like, no, no one wants that. You know, all the work they put in, Zim was not an original Grandmaster. There was no just invitation for him. He didn't get the easiest start that some of the other players have, uh, frankly. Um, he, he worked super hard for it, put an incredible performance in the past year or so uh, to get there. And the last thing you want, is to just go out in one season. Even if you last two seasons, that is significantly better, right? Than just going, okay, here's my first season in. I, I, I lost, got out, try again next time. And that must feel terrible. But Zim will be waiting in the wings for tomorrow. Because for now, like you said, we do have the uh, a legend of Hearthstone in the form of Tice uh, against, uh, again, arguably one of the best players we've ever seen in the form of Hunter Ace. So it's going to be huge. Both players banning out the Warrior. I do believe we are going to be going into a Rogue Mirror to kick it off. But we have that question. Lineup's very similar, but Hunter for Tice versus Warlock for Hunter Ace. Yeah, and that could be the X factor depending on you know where you stand on that matchup. You know, I've, I've heard opinions ranging from uh, heavily hunter favored to slightly hunter favored to uh, even a couple of crazy people saying, "Ah, it's free for the quest warlock." Just no one knows what they're doing. There's always that one quest warlock player out there, right? Whenever yeah. it, whenever there's an intricate combo deck, there's always that one player that's just going to tell you it's favored in every matchup, but no one knows what they're doing. Um, but yeah, I think either way. You slice it, I think the reality is that it is a, a slight favorable for the Hunter uh, for sure, which means the way that the lineups break down against each other, um, Tice might have a slight edge with how it pans out. Um, but the other matchups, maybe you could argue that Quest Warlock has a better spread against the other three, uh, sorry, the other two decks, than uh, Tice's Hunter does if it comes up against the other two decks. Right. And maybe argue uh, Hunter Ace's corner in that. And there's also the uh, the difference between the Rogue builds, which I did not do my due diligence in uh, covering because I was talking much more generally about the stakes <laughs> in this matchup. But Hunter Ace has put a lot of work, a lot of thought, a lot of time, and a lot of research into you know building what he believes to be the optimal build of Rogue. Um, for this relegation bracket, and it is markedly different from anything that anyone else is bringing. Yeah, and there, there's something as well that we can uh, keep an eye on for later on. It's something that uh, kind of bit Hunter Ace yesterday in his match, in that he's not running uh, any eye beams in his Demon Hunter, right? Yeah. So there, there's just no healing there. So not relevant at this moment in time, but maybe we see that come into effect a little bit later on. But for now, let's go into it. 
relegation match for the day. The winner is safe. It can breathe a bit easier, but the loser is going to have to play tomorrow. And the loser of that match tomorrow against Zim is going to end up being relegated as our third relegation from the European Grandmasters, uh, joining, of course, Kalento and Pavel that we said goodbye to last week. But for now, let's kick it off. Is that Rogue Mirror Sottle? And talk to me about this Huntress Rogue. Yeah, it's somewhat unique. Um, I told the story yesterday, um, honestly, expecting that Huntress would do Huntress things and just get out at the first port of call, and I wouldn't have to go back to this well again, but I will tell the story again where um, he was talking to me after his series that... Um, sentenced him to the relegation bracket, essentially. Um, saying, you know, am I doing anything wrong? You get to sit there and you get to watch all of my series. Like, am I making more mistakes than the opponent? Like, please, just tell me. I was like, no, honestly, the only thing that I can criticize you for is that I don't really like some of your lineups. And then we talked about lineups for a little while and came to the conclusion that he was going to look at Rogue a bit more carefully. Um, he then came back to me a few days later and said, right, Soto, it's always rogue. I've got the absolute nuts. Everyone else is wrong. I have the best list. Um, which I believe was the time where the bare bones of this list appeared and he was he was ready to go with it. Since then, his confidence has waned a little bit because he, he came back to me and said that perhaps he was a little bit uh, streaky in his practice at that point and he was high rolling and the, the variance had kind of evened out since then. Um, but it is a somewhat unique build that he is rocking here because it is, I guess you could call it questing adventurer rogue. But he's only playing a single questing adventurer. He's only playing a single prep. He is playing two spy mistress that he's also found room to get in there. So he has those aggressive one drops that you can see here on the board. Uh, he's not playing the beaming sidekicks, which is something we were expecting to see. We haven't actually seen that list, I don't believe, uh, in European GM just yet. But I thought that was the list he was going to end up going with. But he's actually gone in a slightly different direction with sort of a weird hybrid rogue list at the end of the day. Yeah, and uh, I think that overall this should get the soul seal of approval because uh, it has no devoted maniac as one of the cuts there to make yeah. room for all this extra stuff in Untrace's list. But for now, God, that card let's sucks. go. <laughs> uh, yeah, while uh, you were breaking down the game, of course, we did see uh, some of the early turns play out. Nothing too crazy, but most of all, this spy mistress on board for Huntrace is there and waiting to be activated in terms of actually just getting some value because as you mentioned there aren't actually the um the great heart sages in this list this is just right. another uh nod to the fact that hey maybe spy mistress mm. is just good enough to just play in every rogue list yeah yeah sometimes you just play a one drop that has stealth and three attack and your opponent just really has no development options into that and i think we're really just seeing that dynamic here in the early yep. game turns that i kind of talked over Tice not really being able to develop anything super impactful up until now, where he is able to drop Twilight Drake just to over-contest the board. Yeah, now just time to look at whether there are extreme levels of Van Cleef going on here. Uh, there could be a 3 damage here for Untrace with the Spy Mistress and then a Shadow Stat. Could even go as far as playing the Blackjack Stunner to give the Van Cleef a little bit of an extra boost, which I don't mind at all. In the shadows. And this is the question, this is the point. I think up until this is great. Yeah. I think it's worth the stunner because the Van Cleef just gets that much, uh, that, that little bit bigger, right? And going to an A8 means it directly challenges the the uh, Twilight Drake and it needs much more of a commitment from Tides to be able to actually deal with this this turn. Yeah, sure. Otherwise, a backstab, a seal fate, uh, with the help of the Twilight Drake, of course, just deal with this very cleanly. Yeah, I think it's an 8-8 eight -eight, oh, or it's no, not an Edwin I that know. turn because I think, right, as, you, yeah. as you said, the 6-6 six -six is just miserable into this board state based on rogue removals. And then if you reason that through, well, if it's not an Edwin, then what's your turn? And, well, it's nothing. So I think just by process of elimination, <laughs> this was the only play this turn. And also Hunter Ace does have Shield of Galakrond on curve, then potentially yeah. Flick, but also the Galakrond sticking, about, uh, sticking around, worst case scenario. So Hunter Ace does have a reasonable curve here to just follow up with this Van Cleef as well, if Tice can't deal with it. And it's suddenly you've got to be a little bit worried. The extra secret. But it is just two rogue secrets, which Huntress will know does not really disrupt his uh, his board tension. Yeah, and 
when that is the case, it's got to be feeling a little bit good for Hunter Ace because he means he can get a fairly safe uh, Bank Leaf swing at least this turn. So he knows that the ambush can get dealt with here. Crucially as well, these are the two natural secrets from Tice's deck. The two generated secrets are still in the hand. And not that you would have been able to generate two rogue secrets in a row from Hanar anyway. But it, it means that um, he has less concerns about what he's dealing with. And although this looks like madness to the more aggressive players among you viewers, uh, I do like it because the one thing that can really mess with Hunter Ace are secrets right now, and there are a lot of secrets that really uh, uh, could worry him based on the, the outcome this turn. Freezing Trap would be a nightmare. Even Noble Sacrifice would be a bit of a pain, even though he does have the dagger equipped. But Redemption can be a problem to be able to just multi-trade into the Van Cleef over the course of a couple of turns. There's just a lot that could go wrong. So I actually do respect this Hanar trade. Yeah, for sure. Oh, Especially man. when you know, like, Huntress can't see the hand, but he can assume, potentially, that even if the secrets in hand aren't good right now, two rogue secrets were used to trigger Hanar on the previous turn, which means there could be two paladin secrets in the hand, which right. can very cheaply and efficiently start off a secret chain again on the following turn. I'm probably going to see a swing of the weapon first, just to see if it is that noble sacrifice. Huntress is going to get the knowledge that it's not. Also, conveniently test for eye for an eye. As well, because if you just went in for Van Cleef, like, oh, oh, there's eight to myself. Yep. It is still kind of a 50 50 in a sense, though, because you do potentially want that one damage to be dealing with a redemption if it's if it is redemption, which in fact it is, but of right. course, you know, Hunter Ace has to pick things apart as best as you can see. Paladin secrets do tend to be very 50 50 They tend to work out that way. Oh, up to no good. Me too. Double play. Titanic, like you, really nice as well. Yeah, it's the bad news that it is redemption. I believe from Huntress's perspective, it could have still been Never Surrender, but nothing else at that point. Yep. Uh, because he still hasn't propped the Dirty Tricks, which is the remaining Rogue Secret as well. Uh, but gets, I guess, the bad news in his scenario that it is the redemption. So Tice well, the gets Titan to retain a 4-1 here. Does bail him out. Yep. Oh. Means that he's uh, not just a straight-up hit trade. Van Cleef. Oof. Unidentified contract just a little bit too clunky here. No, none of this is great, is it? Let's be honest. Nope. The deadly poison allows him to hit through that miscreant, but so what? I think right. is the response to that, right? Huntress is like, oh great, you, you played that spell, that's the spell you got. I get to hit you again with Van Cleef, go. <laughs> you know, like, I don't think Huntress is going to be too upset with seeing any of these outcomes, actually. It's just the best he's got, though. Hunter Ace can just keep Oof. on smashing face for eight. I wonder if now it, it, it's just... Okay, it doesn't matter. Come on. Oh! I take it all back. Off this is a good turn. <laughs> top. Do you want to test Repentance here, Hunter Ace? You want to throw a Blackjack Stunner out just to play around Repentance? I guess you can get some free information first from uh, Noble Sacrifice, Eye for an Eye right. type things before right. you make that decision. Yeah, I think that's test number one because you can so easily do it, right? You don't even have to commit yep. to a play other than, oh, a 1-1 one, one goes face. What a shame. There's still the other 1-1 one, one to trade if he really wants to as well. It's probably worth it, isn't it? He's so far ahead that I don't think like he it. needs the stunner to plan on winning the game. Uh, and if this gives him a 5-5 five, five instead of a 5-1, could be the world of difference. Because suddenly, Tice has to deal with two threats now, not one. Very nicely done indeed. Hunter Ace just getting the small things right, and I think, you know, they're, they're plays that are a matter of degrees as well. I think it's, you know, hard to argue a definitive right or wrong in that scenario. Like, a lot of it would just be just seeing what the result was and like, oh, he did it right, he did it wrong, you know? Whereas, like, Hunter Ace has just found the way to break down the majority of secrets there. Mm. I say as well. 
we are seeing just con the continued power level of Spy Mistress. Easy to say in just one game we've seen in this series. But Spy Mistress uh, taking out the ambush is just huge, right? It was just sat there waiting for a good target. And it got the good target and continued to protect the Van Cleef and at that point the shield of Galakrond. So everything just adding up there for Huntress and getting the win with the road. Getting this series off to a good start for him at a 1 and 0. Paiso still got plenty of game left. Hunter Ace already, just looking distraught, looking stressed. Uh, Derek was telling the story on uh, the APAC broadcast about how, you know, Hunter Ace is one of the hardest players on himself that we oh. have in Hearthstone. And that even when he is uh, potentially winning games, he's still upset with himself a lot of the time because he doesn't feel, feel like he executed things in an optimal fashion. And when he does make mistakes that lead to losing games, he's even more brutal on himself, which means he holds himself to impossibly high standards. So you can only imagine how, uh, how beat up he's feeling himself with all the pressure that he puts on himself to be underperforming uh, this heavily by his own standards in Hearthstone Grandmasters this season. And you can just see, I think... Week, day by day, week by week, as the weeks have progressed from week one until week seven and now until playoffs, I think you've seen it on his webcam, just his his demeanor, his facial expressions, his reaction to, to bad beats and losing individual games and losing series. I think you've seen it pile up on top of him, and I think you're just continuing to see it now. The stress on these players is incredibly real. Yeah, and I think it's just mounting as well. As I mentioned, I think yesterday, uh, how much of an incredibly story, I don't mean incredibly good, but bad, uh, of if a player who did make it into Division A ended up being that third relegation spot, right? You know, going from uh, Division A, which is relatively safe, to then finishing bottom two, then losing the first match, then potentially losing the second match, then losing the third, like that is, is incredibly, uh, uh, could be an incredibly tough outcome to swallow here for Hunter Ace, honestly. So it's going to look tough for him. That was just game number one, though. But we are going to go to a break while we set up for game number two. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with some more Hearthstone. The Masters Tour is officially upon us. Pull up a seat by the fire and join us as the action unfolds. And the Holy Wrath Paladin makes it all the way to the Grand Finals. You can see the relief on his face. Oh! Oh, oh boy. Big stats! Belkane has it! He's got the bird, he's got the trophy! He is the Masters Tour's whole champion! Greatest fear. So you pass them all. My greatest fear for now is getting relegation for sure. Because if I get relegated, uh, I just don't know what to do then. For me, the greatest fear for now is getting relegated. Because if I get relegated, I just don't know what to do then. For me, the greatest fear for now is getting relegated. 自分が感じる最大の恐怖はその自分の自由時間が取れないことですね。My biggest fear is、uh, insect, the yeah, the insect. 如果问我说我最怕什么的话，呃，也也不是说最怕，可是我比较怕高，我比较怕高。저저라고생각해요저는제가제일뛰어넘어야되는뭐산같은존재이기도하고뭐그런그렇게생각해서그냥저제가제일무서운것같아요더뭐귀신이런거저는안무서워하거든요그래서선택했습니다아니면인간이라고할까 <웃음> 
We are back and ready to continue our series between Hunt Race and Tice. This is a relegation match, so it does mean that the loser is going to have to play tomorrow in that final relegation match, which results in the loser being relegated from Grandmasters. The winner today, though, does stay alive and continue to be a part of Grandmasters going forward. So a lot to play for for both these players. The legend that is Tice and the legend that is, of course, Hunter Ace going up against each other. Hunter Ace getting a win with that Rogue, though, looked pretty good. Again, I do think we might see a, just a very, fairly consistent shift to just Spy Mistress just being a Rogue card as opposed to it really being, okay, if you play Spy Mistress, you have to play the, the stealth package. Yeah, I'm just a huge fan of that card. It took me a long time and a lot of like talking with some very smart deck builders and, and some very strong rogue players to realize that actually the part that I really appreciated this much about Stealth Rogue all this time was just being able to play Spy Mistress on one. And even beyond that, honestly, it's not just an on-curve play. It's not one of those one-drops that like massively decreases in value as the game proceeds because it's still just that consolidated damage over time. Even if you draw it on turn 3, turn 4, turn 5, like it's still just something you can drop in as like a really happy combo activator for an evil miscreant. Right, right, it's right. just very impactful in the, the board state on the, the following turn. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of seeing that card, see more play in a bigger range of rogue decks. And I think, you know, just based on that performance, um, Hunter Races rogue uh rogue concoction has at least paid out for him here in day two of the relegation bracket hey, even if uh, his lineup in day one did not work for him yeah and we are going to be moving on to game number two another mirror but quite different in decks uh, as i did mention earlier on in this series that hunter Ace is not running eye beams nor is he running anything that can generate an eye beam as he is not running the vulpera scoundrels either so any damage hunter Ace receives is permanent in this patient. game tice on the other hand you can see the double vulpera is there and i believe yeah it is going to be I double vulpera and sure. double eye beam so even just that the the sheer difference in each of these players builds uh, could make a massive impact in specifically the mirror yeah, and already turn one, I think Hunter Ace has three or four justifiable lines. Twin Size kill the minion, I think coin Umberwing, I think just recontesting with Beaming Sidekick. Um, Beaming Sidekick and Twin Slicing to kill the minion, just to take what little board dominance that is on turn one. I think you can create arguments for all of those turns. Um, and it's just a, a little microcosm of right. how fascinating the, uh, the Demon Hunter mirror is. Also, you start to see just uh, how powerful twin slices. It's the uh, the highest win rate mulligan card in the mirror, actually. Um, where not only is it just a powerful card almost at any point in the game, and it activates glaive bounds, makes wall glaives great, it allows trades in the very, very, very early game, which sometimes yep. does just pave the way uh, for, for the outcome of the mirror yeah, in itself. So again, you just see those, you know, if, if someone's got twin slice and the other player hasn't, there is a huge difference in what they're capable of in terms of this early removal. Yeah. In, uh, in tempo-based matchups like this, particularly the Demon Hunter Mirror, you can look at it as just backstab with like 15 different upsides later in the game. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Back, backstab has an upside for Rogue in that it's an incredibly efficient uh, combo activator and it's an Edwin Van Cleef tool, but Twin Slice can be used as a backstab, but then also has all of those effects you were talking about by making your Warglaives nuts, activating your Glade Bound on curve without needing coin. All of those yeah. extra things. Altruist just being the absolute giga nuts alongside that card. And yeah, it's a, it's an incredible Hearthstone card. Very it's innocuous just, looking, but insanely powerful. Just like backstab squared or something, isn't it? <laughs> it's yeah. just, like, just so much extra things. But anyway, so far Immolation Aura coming off the Scoundrel. Again, this is just a difference that the builds have. Tice has options of having access to these cards that don't start in his deck. And this Immolation Aura is going to be able to clear up some of the aggression from Hunter Ace. But again, it's not like Hunter Ace is playing less cards than Tice. He isn't just not running the same amount. He does play other cards such as the, the Mana Burn that I think Hunter Ace has been attached to for quite a few weeks now. He has, yeah. Oh my goodness, that Twin Slice is a nutty draw. Hunter Ace initiated Gladebound Tennis here, which is he's entitled to do because he has the second one. So he probably does end up winning the rally if it comes down. Tice would also need right. to have both of them to be able to counteract. But I was about to say, with the Gladebound Tennis initiated, Tice just doesn't have the answer. He's going to have to take infinite damage from these 6-4s coming down. But that Twin Slice off the top just changes so, so much 
Because now Tice is going to be able to swing back board control over the coming turns. Yeah, and this is one of those weird moments where you would think your opponent not having a board is a good thing. Demons. But he does mess with your turns a little bit, right? Like, yeah. Hunter uh, doesn't really want to second slice Glaivebound face, even though he is pushing a good chunk of damage and is leading on health. If he Wallglaives passes, he's potentially, well, he's always susceptible to a, a Shadow Weaver, but still after spending five mana, one turn to do nothing, the next turn that five mana you spent also does nothing, is rough to deal with, so he's going to swing with the Wallglaives. But then again, you can't really just say to and then poke for one when he knows that's already cleared up by your opponent's Wallglaives. So this is where the middle turns of this matchup get really tricky in how you actually use your, your uh, resources to end the game. Yeah, and I love this turn from Hunter Ace, and I think it's a pretty insane read here as well, because I think the fearful thing of making a board here is not necessarily that Tice just smacks it all with his weapon and clears it, it's the threat of that plus Sator Overseer coming down on the other side right. as well that you're then unable to deal with, um, but Tice really hasn't shown any sign of playing Sator Overseer. Um, but Hunter Ace recognizes that the Twin Slice that was used was not in hand on turn 3. So Volpira Scoundrel was played on turn 3, but Sator Overseer wouldn't have been played there anyway because there was no Twin Slice to go along with it. Demons. And then after that point, Hunter Ace mana burned him. So Demons. Sator Overseer just wasn't even a possibility for Tice to be able to drop. So Hunter Ace recognizing oh, that Sator Overseer is very much a card he can give credit to Tice for having in hand and just not wanting to commit any mm. minions which means Tice could get multiple swings into multiple attacks into multiple 2-2s two being generated on the other side. Yeah, and it, it's so odd, isn't it? Because before I make this comparison, so I'll do not get me wrong, but oh. it re reminds me a little bit of like that point in the in life where the, the Druid mirrors were just don't play cards so your opponent can't play cards. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, right? Yeah. You know, and that's kind of the same going into turn five, right? If you don't have any minions, all the strong interactions are based on your opponent's board. But if your board doesn't exist, hmm. it kind of just makes that, this weird stalemate go off. It's so strange. That Altruist might have just changed the plan here for Hunter Ace. Now he might just be in the business of unlocking that Skull of Gul'dan and looking to build up an Altruist lethal here. And that does appear to be exactly what's happening. Mm. It's Otherwise, not like he has to do terrible things to unlock the skull, does he? He gets right. to just push a ton of damage and put a big minion on the board. I've seen worse things to be done to unlock this skull. Yes. Otherwise, I think we may have just been seeing a um, Sator Overseer generation turn instead because, you know, Tice would have to potentially take so much damage to clear it at that point when you yep. get three minions in play that the uh, swing turn coming back the other way wouldn't have been relevant because you just killed them with uh, Gladebound on the following turn. Is that a big difference, though? We can see Tice now has mm. that zero mana eye beam to heal up something. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's going to save him completely, but it exists. Right, and it do that kind of outcome uh, outcome does not exist for Hunter Ace. There is also that metamorphosis, so we could just change into uh, meta and then hero power down to six four. But seven does not feel safe to me, Sotto. It does I not grow impatient. It I mean, feels to be fair, he could actually uh, I beam then meta and still power down the minion. <laughs> it doesn't make him yeah he, as long as he can get that healing. But he might just go for the freeze instead. I will just give you a few facts that might find might make seven feel a little bit safer though is you've seen both Gladebound Adepts, and even if you had them, you can freeze face here, which just shuts off, as we discussed before, basically yeah, every, every <laughs> yeah. source of damage in Demon Hunter, except for minions that they already have on board. And Kane. It's Kane Sun Fury, and it's yeah. Altruis. That's about the only way they have to deal damage at this point, alongside uh, Metamorphosis Ooh. of his own. And now Huntress has... An option to actually just go Altruist, Frozen, Shadow Weaver, the... Oh, I don't know, maybe that's too much. Could still just go Second Slice and Skull, but the problem is, he is starting to face down a good chunk of damage here if he doesn't actually deal with this either Frozen, Shadow Weaver, or Freeze the Face himself. Yep. Demons. Demons. Alas, poor warlock. 
Ooh, second War Glaive is not the one. Alright, Spectral Sight is an improvement. I beam gonna <gasps> blitz past this. Ooh. That's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I might count. Mm -hmm. Although I'll confess, I struggled to want to talk about Demon Hunter lethals after earlier. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I might just be quiet and I let someone else count. Patient. The bad news here for Tice is that he doesn't have a way to get this uh, Skull outcasted to really go fishing for the lethals here this turn. He can refreeze face though, which is a big yes. deal, right? That second shadow, uh, shadow weaver is huge. Can even go for the Sator as well. He can actually just go pretty wide this turn. Is it gold in the shadows? We can see that it's going to be uh, at least reasonably negated by Huntress's Altrius turn. But again, if you're going to start playing around Altrius that heavily, well, you're just going to lose the game anyway, because you can't play right. anything at that point. Right. I do like this from Tice, though. I do like this turn overall. It's just the most threats possible outside of Altrius or Huntress killing him somehow. He's just dead. Yuck. That was not the draw off the top for Hunter Ace. Just get a bit of a go of it, and he still does play Mana Burn as well. Do you see what must be oh wait, did he play it? He played it, right? Oh no, he runs two, he runs two. He, he runs okay. two, he played one. It's uh, yeah, so, someone's running one today, that's why I'm getting thrown up. Playable, that's huge. The ball clear. Tice is currently one off lethal. Tice oh, is no mind. longer one off lethal. <laughs> Tice has won the game. Kane off the top there again. The uh, Sator just uh, not being quite good enough there with the high cost. Tice gets the victory in the mirror. That's going to even it up. I feel like we are going to have this this series. I don't know what's telling me this, but I feel like we are going to go to a game five. It just feels like one, it is that close, and two, it should be that close uh, for, for a, a match of this magnitude. But yeah, it's, it's a really, again, I, I always struggle to get past, and I do harp on about this a lot, but when you are playing that mirror and you know your opponent cannot heal, mm. it really just does make a lot of turns more straightforward. Whether, and I'm not saying no Hunter is lost because he didn't have eye beams, but it's just from your opponent's mindset, from Tice's mindset, he just can't heal, right? He just knows it's not possible. So any damage he does, he can plan for this m uh, many turns in advance and doesn't have to worry to go, oh, well, if they I-beam, then I lose. Or do I have to play differently in case they do I-beam? That just isn't an option in that matchup. And I do think it's something that uh, a lot of players do have to consider if they're thinking about cutting I-beams completely. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that was, from Tice's side at least, kind of a, a tale of two halves where... He started off that game very slowly because his opening hand was not that impressive. Um, but the top of his deck was also pretty kind to him from that point. He right. got the ridiculously clutch uh, twin slice off the top on the glade bound turn to him to be able to war glaze it down. And then back to back frozen shadow weavers to be able to lock out that war glaives damage from Hunter Ace, which probably made all the difference for the lack of altruist lethal at the end of the game there. Um, so, you know, you can slice that one whichever way you want, because obviously if you have a pretty poor opening hand, there's a pretty good chance you're going to draw your good cards because you didn't have yeah. them in your opening hand. So um, you can probably look at it from both sides. But I think, you know, Huntress might just be a little bit aggrieved because uh, back to back Frozen Shadow Weaver, I think, is definitely a tilter if you're on the receiving side of that. And uh, do you <laughs> 100%. Here? Yeah, but looks like we are going to get into Rogue versus Warlock. And I'm excited, Sottle, because, again, I was maybe giving Warlock a hard time last week. Uh, and maybe it's not going to pay off this week. But regardless of its uh, win rate or its potential in Grandmasters, I love watching it. I think I could watch someone play Quest Warlock all day and just not be bored. Because I think, one, it's a very fun deck. But two, it's also a very intricate deck where decisions make insane levels of impact packed into the game. Yeah, and I think this matchup is one where the dynamic has shifted quite dramatically. I think just a couple of weeks ago, 
even one week ago, this was a matchup where the experienced Quest Warlock players felt very comfortable. Uh, they felt like, you know, they could ration through the threats that Rogue presents quite nicely with their removal and then take over and be dominant in the late game. Um, but Rogues have kind of reacted to that and reacted to some of the other classes in the meta game by adding this double questing adventurer into the deck. And suddenly that addition of extra threats and also additional early threats that can come down and just blow out the game has made all the difference. And I think swung this match up a lot further back towards the Rogue side. Yeah, relatively small sample size in Grandmasters, but um, Rogue has a 75% win rate versus Quest Warlock. Again, that is a small sample size, but still, it has won a lot more times than it has lost. Mm. So uh, we'll see how this one plays out. But it is, for me, I, I do agree, down to those quest adventures, just being those threats that might be a little bit too big, might make the dark skies just not so quite nice. work smoothly enough, and so on. So we'll see how it plays out, though. Suntrace does have a pretty good open quest and explorer plot twist is there not really fa not facing down a, uh, a spy mistress because i believe yep tice is running the more standard just the secret package with the quest and adventures times two yep tice though does have the opportunity to go off with a questing adventurer as early as next turn and i really like it especially when you've seen these taps uh not uh, Oh. Question. Would a quest warlock dark skies that turn, Subtle? On average? Sorry, I was still freaking out at this hand. What was the question? <laughs> Would quest warlock dark skies that board on turn uh, I probably wouldn't, no. Okay. Well, instead of Tice building up a quest adventure on board, he's going to do it all with Van Cleef instead, which looks fine to me. Insane. Oh, those boards where Dark Skies just doesn't cut it. <laughs> yep. But what is it? What is Huntress to do? I think he just has to continue with the plan. Go for the Explorer. Go for the plot twist and try and just pull something out the bag a little bit later. Maybe uh, shuffling the Kalidan back in the deck gives him it on a redraw soon. Uh, oh, we're there already, are we? <laughs> Shuffle the well, Keladan in and then rip yeah. it on exactly turn I mean, six. Yeah. I mean, if he even makes it, this is just two turn, right? For for Tice, outside of some heals. Yeah. With only five out of twenty, I, I I do think Huntress just has to go for it. Like, what else is there? So he taps. He draws nine cards. He plot twists eight cards to go up to fourteen, which means if he redraws plot oh. twist. So if he redraws Plot Twist, he can Plot Twist again next turn and then get one tap into one zero mana card, if that's what it comes down to. He did not redraw the Plot Twist. Oh, Edwin, Edwin, Edwin. Shake the head from Huntrace. No tomb can hold me. And honestly, to a certain extent, even though not really what this mummy is normally used for, the fact that it's a reborn minion that can push extra damage per post uh, certain levels of removal is huge as well. Moog Rain would shoot seven shots, and there's currently five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten needed to clear the board. Twelve, including the Moog, that would be in play, so that's I nothing. Wonder. Rain of Fire, Rain of Fire, Mortal Coil is only six damage to the Edwin Van Cleef, so that is also nothing. Moag Coil to draw into Nether Breath. Does that keep him alive? You'll go up to 20 and there'll be 30, 40, 15 on board. Is that just the, the play, right? Okay. Can Nether Breath the Van Cleef and set up a removal next turn? Sure. It just, it just has to, right? It's the only thing that even keeps him up. Sure. Gonna be it. No tomb can hold me. He can still follow this up now with Rain of yep. Fire and still technically be alive. As we all know, technically alive is the best kind of alive. <laughs> yep. So 10, 11. Could prep into Evil Miscreant, double cobbled for the win. 
<laughs> easy peasy, easy peasy, right? <laughs> yep, seems good. So many options. Yes, ties. I mean, yeah, feel, you just do it. Feel right? the power. <laughs> From nothing power. You won in 13 Hunter Ace every day of the week. <laughs> also, as well, if, if you look at about this. Uh, look, huh? I was momentarily confused as to why his secret cost zero, and then I realized what he started the combo chain with. Oh, it's okay, fine. okay. Continue. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you um, remove the... Uh, oh, if he gets two cobalt, he wins. This still puts the same amount of extra health on board as a Shield of Galakrond would as well, mm -hmm. with the Lackey and the Miscreant uh, equal mm -hmm. up to five. So even though, yes, it could have been cobalt for the win, of course, it's not like, oh, well, if he does this and misses it's worse than another play, right? Because right. Shield of Galakron, yes, this play doesn't have the same level of attack, has the same level so of health, and as long as this Van Cleef just does not die uh, from, say, a Dark Skies, then it means Untrace pretty much just has to have the uh, the Nether Breath, or now, arguably, the Keladan again. Oh, still doesn't keep him up because of Dagger. Never mind. <laughs> So many possibilities. So ugly. Even if you cut into the health with soul fire, there's still eleven remaining. Mm. No! Rain of fire, soul fire now does clear. It means Tice needs what one damage. Yep. No seal targets. No. There is just Shield of Galakrond into Cobalt again. <laughs> yeah, Cobalt, Cobalt. Just always the option. Yeah, even though he only needs one damage, obviously that includes Dagger, so he does need exactly Cobalt if he goes for the out mm. off uh, Shield. Yep. Most importantly as well, uh, even if the zero extra damage from Tice this turn, uh, mm. even just the push from the Miscreant makes Huntress unable to tap, uh, which again just limits his options, right? Yeah, he's still three cards away, two after the natural draw next turn from completing quest and having that restriction removed. Merlock? Blue Gill! Oh. Okay. Still Huntress in a pretty dire spot. Alex Straza, not good enough, can't tap. But he's going to anyway. Who am I to tell Huntress he cannot tap? He does, but he takes the loss there. Ties goes two and one up there. Oh. And honestly, what an opening. And again, I, I do love watching Quest Warlock. Maybe not when that happens, because if you can't directly kill that Van Cleef, it's looking pretty dicey as we did see. But there was zero nether breaths for Hunter Ace. As we can see, Van Cleef wa it was around the sort of across two turns where just a nether breath would have made the world of difference there. Um, not only to heal, but also just bring Van Cleef's health down, especially with the help of a Moag, if that came out after the coil turn. So a rough game there for Hunter Ace, as are all games that involve a big Van Cleef early on. But that means Tice only has his Hunter left to take down Hunter Ace. It's not looking good, is it, for old Casper? It is not. But how are we liking the look of this Hunter list, oh, Mr. Hunter Connoisseur? Uh, it's not got the secret package, so I, I don't mind it, is my instant response. It also doesn't have that Grand Slam, yeah, so I don't love it yeah, either. Now you're it's, getting it. Th this is one of those lists where I would just say it's fine. I don't think... <laughs> you know, I, I, I understand that some of the you know the reasoning, again, the difference between uh, Tolve and the... Uh, oh, I've just completely lost the name of the card. Aren't you? Bone yep, there we go. Uh, is slight, but it is relevant as well uh, for matchups, say, against specifically Rogue. But overall, the list is just fine. Again, I, I personally like Nagran Slam a lot, as you may or may not have noticed from the two weeks of casting. Um, again, not a huge fan of Mana Saber personally, because yeah. I, I like the consistency of what your, um, your uh, Scavengers actually does. But overall, the list is just fine. I just dislike the secret package. That's where I really draw a line in whether I think a hunter list is okay or not.
And now Huntrace diverting. He is going to go back to Demon Hunter here. And again, it is another matchup where the uh, lack of I-beams could come back to right. punish you because I think generally you're a better class at dominating board um, than Hunter most of the time. Um, I think Hunter doesn't quite get enough credit as to how good its early tempo starts are um, with the curve that the deck currently plays. Um, but I do think Demon Hunter is just the best class at being able to do that. Agreed. So yep. a lot of times you just win board. Um, however, you have to use your face smashing into minions in order to do so, which if you don't then have healing available, gives uh, Tice and the Hunter the ability to just go straight over the top and just race you from the point where they lose board control. Right, and there are some back-breaking cards as well in the early game from Hunter, even versus Demon Hunter. Of course there is Zephyrus, right? But early scavengers Ooh. against slightly less because they're mana saber, but early scavengers into a three drop rush with decent health is pretty strong. But also, either of the weapons are very powerful too, right? Yes. Like the desert space, huge versus demon hunter, as each turn you effectively get to kill a minion, roughly. Uh, and then the storm hammer is, of course, just storm hammer, so that's powerful in itself. So there are some draws that are just insane. We are seeing this now. Tyson coin, being able to coin out two drop into two drop, is going to give him a, a, a good amount of uh, questions to ask on Trace into whether he can clear this cleanly or not. But this is what I mean when I was talking about the difference between a, being a good early game class and the best early game class, right? right? Like It's twin slice. <laughs> yeah, Tice's early game looks stellar. Coin two into two, one of them's a fairy dragon. Look what happened to it. Suddenly there is just a 2-4 smacking you in the face and your t coin two into two line has done absolutely nothing. Get used to a twin slice. To the board state. <laughs> ah, okay. Oh! Okay. That is good, though. That, that like is I good. said, like, the, if you can Zephyrus early on against Demon Hunter and then just keep up because the Zephyrus managed to just even up the speed of the start, then there's a good chance. I think I like milking the Zephyrus here a little bit, though. Oh, yeah, I don't think you need to play now. It doesn't give you the answers that you need right now. Mm -hmm. Agreed. The Fairy Dragon is equally miserable, though, if not more so. I will concede that point. Quickly. So you want to track it into the true MVP, right? The Dwarven Sharpshooter. Yeah, I was thinking maybe that turn <laughs> is just a tracking for three extra cards for... Um... Hey, what? I think you wanted Power Shield. Oh, okay. I think that's the outcome all the time, right? On that board. I honestly don't know what the Power Word Shield rules I... are. If, if, if Celestalon right. wants to tell me what the Power Word Shield rules are, then I'll <laughs> gladly be educated, but I do not know what they are. I only think I've never... I've only ever seen Power Word Shield on an empty board. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, th I think that outcome was always the case there. But yet, you don't always get it on an empty board. <laughs> this is what confuses True, me. <laughs> but I, I've never gotten it on a board with other minion, other enemy minions on it, is right. what I'll say. So, okay. uh, and that that was the true fact that happened there, right? Mm. Ivan Griffin, Mana Saber. Mana Saber does uh, open up some ramp, but the problem is, uh, is, is there really time for that? Right. Most importantly, the Griffin uh, will draw him into a... Uh, a rush minion and a quick scroll through. Uh, Tice is playing the Faceless Corruptor, so it could get him that, or it could get him his Zixel, of course. Uh, yeah, but to finish the point I was making before the Zephyrus came down, I was curious maybe if it was just tracking that turn, since Fairy Dragon did nothing, and then you can look for like Desert Spear, uh, Stormhammer right. kind of stuff, like something to make sure that your turn three at least achieves something, and then try and uh, milk out the Zephyrus to maybe turn four, turn five, to be able to react with a like Cleave or Soul Cleave or something to be able to catch yep. yourself back up. And it's pretty likely Hunter uh, has an incredibly, you know, dense one to three drop, right, in, yeah. in, in its uh, build. So being able to have a strong turn three play is very likely, actually, from a tracking at that point. Mm -hmm. But now Zephyrus gone gives Hunter Ace a lot Demons. more freedom to proceed as he pleases here. Demons. Is this ever Altrius <laughs> and one battle mage? Apparently it the is. One -ones? I mean, what? What kills you, right? What kills the Altrius? 
uh, the rush minion that you know your opponent has. Hmm. Right, but then you get to keep Shadow Weaver. Mm -hmm. Which I think is that whether I it's was, a face. I was simply answering thrower. the question, Raven. I like this, and this doesn't give a target for Corruptor, which would be the bad outcome here for Trace. Right. And he pushed a ton of damage. Yeah, I think that's the kicker, right? Is that 50% of the time, Tice's turn here is only kind of sucky. The other 50% of the time, whether he hit Faces Corruptor instead of the Zigzor, it's an entirely miserable turn. Yeah. I think... Your prophecy uh, is being fulfilled, Raven. It's looking very much like we are marching towards a game five. I did have a funny feeling, Sol. Being able to push this damage, the mana burn also uh, locks out. Again, not amazing Hunter turns, but the fact that he goes down to four mana does look out some plays. But most importantly, it's just a wide board that Hunter just has no real way to deal with outside of exactly Zephyrus. And we've seen that Zephyrus has already been used. Well yep. Right. Unleash the Hounds only removes three from play. Stormhammer only removes three from play and takes two damage in the process. So neither of those options were going to prevent the lethal coming in from Hunter Ace. And he now has this squared up. But here we are, Raven. Yala with the Galakron Warlock, has been stomping through this bracket. Yala is the player with the, been bringing Galakron Warlock and is sitting on the top of the proceedings in the division. Yala is the player that had the easy march uh, through the bracket to qualify himself for finals on Sunday. But now Hunter Ace is left with the much more in vogue Quest Warlock on his side. Right. And honestly, it's the deck that has been seeming to struggle here in Grandmasters. Yep, yeah, is very susceptible to Hunter as well. Uh, one thing I will just say is the last night I would be interested to see if uh, if that was almost just a punish with that Zephyrus play from Tice in the previous game. Uh, I think that I, I was all, all on board with you there and saying if you greed it out a little bit and get a bigger either AoE sweep, single target removal, bigger threat, then maybe that yeah. looks very, very different. So um, yeah, just one of those things. I think if that was the, the point in the game uh, where the, the paths could have changed there for Tice. But anyway, as you said, it's going to be Hunter versus this Warlock. and. It's a tough matchup, and don't get me wrong, Warlock can definitely get the job done because Hunter doesn't often recover from the big nether breath turns if those turns not only heal the Warlock, but kill off the threats from the Hunter at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are those draws where Hunter just gets there. Most of their deck is one to three, which makes their opening very, very consistent. And if they have just one or two tools that go beyond that, keep the pressure up uh with most importantly i would say just the uh the evasive fey wing i think is the true uh, <laughs> uh threat in the deck against warlock on curve then this is going to be a tough one for Huntrace. yeah huntrace mulligan is enormously important in this matchup as it is with most matchups with this deck <laughs> as it is with most matchups in hearthstone and straight away, we see Stormhammer coming to hand for Tice, but Hunter Ace does have the ooze. And now rewind your mind 24 hours to the point where Hunter Ace dropped an ooze just to get a card out of his hand and then was immediately met with the Stormhammer on the other side. So two points. One, being able to ooze a Stormhammer is ridiculously powerful and maybe even game-winning for Hunter Race. On the other side, Tice is going to go one, two, three, four tracking. Worst yep. case. Yep. And that three and four are the most powerful three and fours you can do against Warlock. So now the, the ooze gives Hunter Ace oh. a chance, but it is I by no means winning him the game. I don't even think it does. I think if anything, playing the ooze here diverts Hunter Ace from what he needs to do, which is drawing Dark Skies. Like, I don't think you can win this game without drawing Dark Skies from this point because the curve is so powerful. Hunter Ace doesn't necessarily know that because he doesn't know Evasive Fey Wing is going to be the follow-up here. My god... Hun okay, Casper, you are a genius. You are an actual lord. How did you know that? Life tap, coin ooze. The tap came first. He knew the situation better than I did, and he can't see the hand. That's right. incredible. And the fact he had coin to... I don't want to say bail out, because 
it was always part of the plan. But, you know, the fact that he could tap, uh, see what he got, and then go into the coin to ooze as an emergency, and yep. that was exactly Dark Skies. Yep. Hunter Ace, it is going to pay off for him. Is it? I'll tell you right now, I wouldn't have made that play. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that right now. I wouldn't have made it. But uh, I'd also have been the hunter in this scenario. Uh, yeah, that's true, yeah. <laughs> no, I've but... seen you. You would have made exactly all of these plays. You would have gone one, two, three, four with a storm hammer. I've seen you play. <laughs> exactly. What well, good, what can I say? But that play incredibly powerful does still not put Hunter Ace ahead. It just means he doesn't just get killed. It just means he is alive. He gets to play right. Hearthstone this right. game. But again, next next hurdle, Hunter Ace, tap into a dragon next, because you're going to need it pretty yep. soon. Oh, that Dark Skies is so clutch. It is. Because it, there's just no other way to kill the Feywing, right? The Feywing nope. just wins the game otherwise. So now we officially have a game of Hearthstone, because Tice has a extremely dead turn here. That's an unbuffed I Griffin in hand, which is... A really or miserable he has feeling play. The ultimate turn of tracking into Mana Saber Soul. I wonder. Sure. He's thinking about Griffin Hero Power, but I think tracking's way too good here. There are so yeah, many good track. options for him. Yep. I think you always track here. Diving Griffin is your turn and just giving your opponent like mortal coil was their turn. Nah. Right, yeah. I think go for Zixar here. Looks pretty good to me. Survives a uh, Netherwing, Hunker, whereas the uh, the Shadow Weaver would not. Oh, the decisions are not getting any easier here for Hunter Ace. That plot twist looking like it's going to be essential healing and essential quest completion this game. But he has Moag Nether Breath in hand, but what good is Moag Nether Breath in hand when it's unactivated? So many possibilities. And there's no world where he can Moag Rain of Fire Coil, right? That's that's too. Oh, <gasps> it went yellow. Oh, look at Hunter Ace. <laughs> now what? If anything, that just makes the know. turn harder. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I was pretty I set know. on a plot twist right up until that happened. Now I have no <laughs> idea again. What if it's just there's... Nether Breath? Yeah, I think. Yeah. So I think he has to just flatten out the breath this, right? Hunter does not really have, like, high-powered turn six plays, right? Sure. So just nether breath and hope he can get off the uh, Abyssal Summoner next turn, maybe? Right. I, I, I think that's the best plan he's got. Beast kill command now in hand for Tice. Is he just setting up the... Uh... Going for the Zixor here? Mm -hmm. Not not going for it this turn, obviously, but just setting up the draw to go uh, 6, 7, 8. Yeah, I think he doesn't necessarily just want to tempo Varanus because then he's going to in be interacting with Abyssal Summoner the wrong way round from his perspective. I think he'd much rather react to an Abyssal Summoner with his Varanus. But with this hand, he could have done that better though, right? He plays Varanus, then he has Griffin Kill Command. Is that not Sorry, what are you saying? How does that not? How does that help you against an abyssal summoner? Because the Griffin and Kill Command kill the taunt, and then you have a seven six to go face. Right, 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 right. Okay, I see what you're saying. Like to me, that's actually way better. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> that's a good point. That is a good point. This is a it's a juicy mortal coil target, isn't it? It is. Quest to it's so means enticing. That Hunter Ace can draw a ton more cards this turn, but guess what? Next turn is it's called turn seven against Hand Hunter. You know what happens every single turn seven? I do. Dino Tamer Bran. Yep. So I, I this is a tough choice to make here from Hunter Ace, but I like it. I think every turn he's had <laughs> a tough choice to make this game, and I think every turn he's probably got mm. it right. And I. Uh, yeah, yeah, this this is good. I was, I was working out whether there was ever a world in which he uses the uh, Dino Tamer to kill the Taunt and push four face now. That was ever worthwhile. But I think this just works out fine. 
Seen one nether breath, which is the big deal, right? Second coil is a fairly efficient clear here. If he wants to commit the Moog. Hmm. Of course it's the right way. And you see, like, the 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 level of importance Huntress is putting on this quest, right? Obviously, the deck has got Quest Warlock. But yeah. he could have Kelidan this and gained the board, right? Oh, it's not like much. A 3-3 three, three and a 2-1, and you and you don't take any damage. Right. Uh, it, it is something to do. He gains the board against Hunter. But right. Huntress has to draw cards. He needs to get to the Aranasi Brood Mothers. He needs to get to the other Nether Breath. He needs to get his quest live. So he can start doing the broken thing. Oh, the yep, Zixor like Prime is backbreaking so. now. There is the Twisting Nether to answer it, and this is essentially just a time warp for the two players. Yeah, but that's what that's Entice's favor, because it gets rid of the Nether, and it opens up the Bran on an empty board if it is, is it, Nether this turn. Is it Entice's favor? Because I he see it as... Bran face. I see it as this turn got skipped, and Hunter Ace got one turn closer to quest completion. He got one turn closer to drawing another Nether Breath, another Moag Artificer, drawing our Nassi Brood Mothers off the top. You'll find me wherever we are. Kais is the one that wants to go quickly here. I actually wondered if that was the other way around then, but yeah, I guess it doesn't always matter. This is huge. The Dragon Bane Kill Command Hero Power I was just looking at then, but now it's post Moag. Ah! He just used it. And don't get me wrong, I am not saying Hunter he shouldn't have used the Moag, but if it ever feels bad, it's the next turn when yeah. you draw the only Nether Breath you have left. So many yeah, I am quite surprised that turn that was contesting the Varanus was neither a Keladan nor a plot twist turn from Hunter A. So I was expecting it to be one of those two things and it ended up being neither. Trace preserves his Keladan again, it looks like. Again, he could have just gotten Keladan, Nether Breath, but that does not fit in a life tap. It doesn't fit in a plot twist. The problem here. Oh my goodness. Is he's just dead. He's just dead. There's Dragon Bane. There's Hero plot twist. Power. He's plot twisting. He's plot twisting. Oh, there's a hope. Oh, okay. <laughs> he needs both. I can tell you that much. There's one. Okay. And that's it, right? That's the last card. That is the last card. Yeah. And most importantly, he can't life tap to get a playable minion. So Dragon Bane, Hero Power, Command. All clean empty board. Tight is going to win his relegation bracket match and survive in the European Grand Masters, and you can see what it means from there. And unfortunately for Hunter Race, he is going to have to play tomorrow. And even with him coming from Division A, it's all on the line. One match left, win and in, that is it. But congratulations to Tice there. And again, very similar, but maybe a little bit different to a silver name, Tice's ultimate legion of fans will no doubt be ecstatic to see he has avoided the chance at relegation and he is safe in grandmasters for another season yeah and of course first things first huge congratulations to tice i'm sure a yeah. ton of people have been made extremely happy as raven was talking about his legions of fans his legions of stream viewers uh, tice will be hanging around for one more season he is safe but Boy, that was hard to watch. You could you could just see it on his face at the end. I don't need to explain it any more than what you just witnessed on his webcam in the lower left. Yeah. Hunter Ace Hunter Ace is feeling it, but Hunter Ace has one more chance now, and he is gonna line up against Zim. Zim was the player with the lowest seeding going into this. Hunter Ace was the player with the highest. Yeah. And those two must now clash. To enter, only one survives. One of those final two players in our very first match tomorrow is going to end up being relegated from Grandmasters Season 1 2020. Yeah, all this weird looking bracket doesn't need to make sense anymore. Just look at match three. The loser is gone. 
the winner gets to survive. And as Sol just mentioned, it is actually not going to be our last match of the day, as the previous two days have been. It's going to be our first match. So um, we don't end the day too upset, at least, even though I have no doubt, regardless of the outcome, it's, it's, it's going to be rough. But we are going to finish off with the uh, top four matches tomorrow. But I don't know, Sol. It's just there. Uh, again, we talk about more relegations, make it more exciting, puts more on the line for all these I players. I know. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's fun to watch as a viewer, and it does raise the stakes, but we still feel it for the players, right? And even from our point, uh, this is, uh, again, exciting to cast, but it is tense. We know all these players, right? We don't want to see anyone like super upset, or we don't want to see anyone go home, but we also do get to see new players come up. And as, you know, Hunter a slightly different system, but Hunter Ace, not too long ago, was a new up and coming player. And look what he's done for himself. So I do think that is an important thing to happen. Uh, so, you know, again, it, it feels bad for us knowing these players and for you guys knowing the players, but it has to happen for us to see more new blood come in and show us what they've got. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, I've followed Hunter Ace's career pretty closely because he, he first rose to prominence um, with the Rat Race, where he was, you know, the. 14, 15 year old kid, whatever he was at the time, right. like crush, crushing everyone else on ladder. And then he, that, the year that started off with the unprecedented feat of the three star master dominance throughout the whole tour stop system, everyone said three star masters was impossible. He kicked off the season in Germany. I was there to cast it. I got to cast him in person for the first time and was like, wow, this kid is special. Like, this is an honor to watch this guy play Hearthstone. He lost in the final. He then lost in the final again. I was then there to cast his first tournament win in Seoul, where he finally got over the hump and actually won one. And then, of course, you and I were both fortunate enough to call one of the greatest series of Hearthstone <laughs> yeah. of all time Ooh. in that World Championships final against Viper. So I, you know, do feel a personal connection to Hunter Ace's Hearthstone career. And I, you know, there's no such thing as, you know, too good to be relegated. If that's what the results right. say, that's what the results say. But if there's anyone close to making that a reality, I have to imagine that it's Hunter Race. But now, mm. obviously, Zim and Hunter Race tomorrow now have everything on the line. And boy, is it going to be tense. Yep. So if there's ever a time to make sure you are subscribed to the YouTube, you have those alerts on, you've got all the notifications in the world, the alarm set, it is now because it is going to be our first match tomorrow in the European Grandmasters. It is one you just cannot miss if you have even a passing interest in competitive Hearthstone. It's going to be a big deal no matter what the outcome is. Then, of course, we get to our top four match to decide who from the European region this season is going to be booking their spot at the World Championships. But from Sol and myself, we had a crazy day and we've got one more left. Thanks a lot for watching. We appreciate it. It's going to be America's coming up right after us, so don't go anywhere. There'll be more Hearthstone. But from us, goodbye. Thank you.